everybody. Welcome to our eighth installment of Are You Aware with Aware Consulting Group. We've got Angel Prater here and Dean Gray, Dr. Dean Gray. Um, and my name is Fawn Preston. And today uh, the topic is legalize it, don't criticize it. How do we feel about that? <laughs> well, I'm dating myself here, but I'm, I'm sure you all remember Peter Tosh's uh, 1976 album, uh, Legalize It which was about the uh, legalization of cannabis. Um, and in his song, the song that had the same title as the album itself, he talked about all of the medical benefits um, that had been attributed to cannabis as far as uh, we knew in 1976. And um, yes, it was kind of the first time that I had ever uh, started to talk, think in my mind, you know, as a young girl about um, what what is he talking about? What does that mean? And uh, now to be working in the addictions medicine field all these years later and um, um, watching uh, how as a society we, we are um, in a structural way, um, we are trying to address some of these issues of... Um, health and uh, wellness um, and substance use, uh, it just seems that what we're doing isn't really working. It's not working. Um, we are in a profound state of suffering. Um, and I think we need to consider every option. We need to look at every option. We, yeah. Everything should be on the table at this point. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um for discussion. Yeah. For discussion. And, yeah. and we need to, I mean, we've got so many smart people um, thinking about these things and doing the good work. Um, but nothing seems to be getting better in a, in an infrastructure kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, there's pockets of good stuff being done all over the place, but we really need to band together and open our minds and hearts and, um, share some ideas and be creative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have definitely some thoughts on that. I'm wondering, um, can we do the aware highlight? Oh, and the then aromatic. yes, um, I think that that'll also kind of weave into some of what we're talking about. So. Okay. All right. Yeah. Let's so see. Who's our aware highlight there, Christine? Aware highlight today is Dave Dahl. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. And I know you two know him personally. Yes. I do a little Angel bit. Angel does. A little mm -hmm. bit. Yeah. Exciting. Not a lot. So here's Dave's story. Uh, some of his story. Here's a snippet. After serving a total of four prison sentences for crimes ranging from burglary to armed robbery to drug dealing, Dave Dahl turned his life around during his last stint and rejoined the family bakery shortly after his release. He went on to co-create Dave's Killer Bread, once sharing abandoned houses with cockroaches in Detroit, he now lives in a luxurious high-rise penthouse in downtown PDX. His story epitomizes transformation. Dave had to accept that, at least for Dave Dahl, there's no happily ever after. But he finds great satisfaction in fighting the good fight one day at a time. He believes that forgiveness of self and others is one of the keys to inner peace and personal growth. But it's only one of the many lessons he's come away with through all of his struggles and triumphs. Now with a healed heart and mind, he steps back out on a mission to help inspire others to find their own brand of success. Good seed is much more than a killer bread recipe. My having, favorite. <laughs> <laughs> having been a bad seed and destroying everything in my path as a troubled young man, I finally found the path of humility and teachability. It gives me the courage to fall down seven times and get up eight. Mm -hmm. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. He's pretty cool. Yeah. That is a great story. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, I'm excited to have this discussion after reading that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Legalize it. How do you feel about legalizing it? Um, we just legalized weed in Oregon. It's been what? How many years? Three, maybe? No, uh, just uh, 
2020 and then launched in February 2021. Well, for the decriminalization measure one, for the measure one. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm but, sorry. But you weed's been legal. Weed. I want to say. Oh, mm-hmm. I want to say six ish years because mm-hmm. it happened right after I moved out here, mm-hmm. and then we decriminalized um, small, small amounts of drugs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, small amounts. Mm-hmm. Measure one done. Yeah. Well, um, I guess, I mean, historically, what we have had is a really hardcore stance on um, illegal drugs and people who use them, Mm -hmm. on illicit drugs, I guess, and people who use them. We have made them illegal drugs. um, Mm -hmm. And it's resulted in, uh, so it's resulted in a lot of uh, expense and jail time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it causes problems lifelong for individuals, Mm -hmm. even when they get out of the jails or prisons, they have this now crime, a criminal background Mm -hmm. that, uh, prevents them from doing even heart work type of things or, or head work or getting getting an apartment, getting a place to live. live. Yeah. Yeah, All of the things. It's like what happened to our, uh, belief system or our judicial system that says, guilty and um and uh innocent i mean until proven guilty yeah, yeah like innocent until proven guilty and then once you're guilty do you go to jail and prison and then you come out and you have to repeat the same yeah, old lifestyle because you have no other way to survive mm-hmm. often often that is the case yes it's really total class abuse but um mm-hmm. Class that'll abuse. Be, that'll Ooh, be, that'll be another like podcast. That'll be another, that'll be another <laughs> podcast. <laughs> um, yes, because we know. Well, we know that it doesn't affect people equally, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we know mm-hmm. that these, all of the systems that we have in place. Am I exaggerating? Is it all of them? Most of the systems. There's a two tier system, guys. Right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's a system for people with good insurance and a system yeah. for people who don't have good insurance. Mm-hmm. There's a education system. There are schools for people with with resources and then there are schools, schools for, people without. for people without, mm-hmm. right? That's how yeah. we end up with standardized um, right. education. Yeah. Right. Well, that's another mm-hmm. podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so too, the judicial system, there's the system for people who have uh, an attorney and a private attorney. And there's a system for people who don't to mm-hmm. sit in jail waiting to meet with a judge because yeah. they don't have any, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, they're missing work. They're getting fired from their jobs. They're not getting their and, and what some of our difference. listeners, yeah, some of our listeners might be, but they get court appointed attorneys. Yeah, That's nine Good luck times with the out of ten, attorney. you're going to have a court appointed attorney that is burnout or busy, yeah. and they're mandated to participate in they pro meet bono with you ten minutes before um, your court hearing. And- I've seen some good ones. I've seen um, some. But- you there, know, there's the too much part. work. There's, there's too way much too work. much work. Yes, it's too much work. Mm-hmm. It's like being a medical resident. Mm-hmm. There's too much work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Too many, too many sick people. Too yeah. many people that are being jailed for anyway. So what we, they were for being that are being jailed for possession of cannabis. <clears throat> so um, I think in some places they are now retroactively going back and that. eliminating or That's dropping awesome. those charges for people yeah. who people who are sitting had, in prison for yeah, pot. For yeah. Oh my goodness. I know, right? And but the problem is, guys. I mean, in other developed worlds that's just never been the case you know right. i mean this we've had a particularly um egregious approach to to people who use cannabis um and and other drugs and other drugs and yeah. as our as our understanding of substance use and mental wellness has changed um our the other systems have not yeah. have not evolved um, and so for me, I mean, I think that's why I am interested in taking a look at what it might mean to change our stance on things, because we know, we know that putting somebody in prison because they are using drugs is not going to solve the problem. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Um, well, and I just feel like our system needs to catch up. Even with the pot situation, so pot's legal, but it's not federally legal. It's not federally legal, and so it's still something that can keep people from getting employment. It's mm-hmm. still something that can keep people from housing. You know, if somebody is living in an Oxford house and they test dirty for pot, you know, they're going to get kicked out. If they test dirty for a cigarette, they're not going to get kicked out, which is also legal in Oregon. So Which I have is some also a mood-altering substance, right. just a different mood. Totally. Different Are you house. testing my pist for Monster? No. 
Right. Because okay. monsters because are mood over altering substance. That, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, you guys. The tobacco lobby is one of the biggest lobbies yeah. on Capitol yeah. Hill. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Gabba Mate talks about that very specifically is like, you know, the United States focusing on the United States on how we criminalize people who are suffering, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and they're surviving by using drugs, right? Or they're surviving some very painful experiences and, and using this as a survival skill. Mm -hmm. Well, um, he hit the nail on the head when you think about um, keeping people more and more oppressed mm -hmm. by keeping them criminalized versus um, giving them pathways to wellness and pathways. Mm -hmm. So why don't we take, this is just off the top of my head, why don't we take, you know, a large percent of the prison dollars that are often for profits uh, driving. Mm, that's where my prisons, brain's going right, right now. Just um, saying. Take some of those prison dollars and reintegrate it into society mm -hmm. for wellness dollars, right? Yeah. Like, because mm -hmm. people, there's many, many, many people in prison systems and jail systems that are um, beautiful people. And yeah. they, they, they go into these systems and they come out very, re-traumatized and yeah. more Well, I hate pain. to say it like this, but, you know, they talk about the monster factory, mm -hmm. right? You go in for something small and you come out a bigger, badder, you know, yeah. criminal. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Because you learn all the things and you get more oppressed and you get more salty about the system and all of these things within this environment, you know, but the point And you're is learning simple. some good skills, yeah. survival skills. Totally. Oh, and, skills. You, and you're building you have access networks. to drugs. And, yeah. And you have yeah, access absolutely. to building networks. Oh, you're from that hood. Okay, homie, mm -hmm. check it out. Can let I? Me, let me go. I'll tell your buddy out there about what's happening in here when yeah. I get out because I'm getting out in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Now you've developed a community mm -hmm. that you didn't have. Yeah. And now absolutely. you're intersecting. Yeah, well, in and we all know that that system, like you said, are mostly for profits. Um, you know, that's how make the prisons make a lot of money. Right. And so historically, that is why we have so many people, you know, who are imprisoned and other. Um, I really like when we actually see good things happening within those systems. Mm -hmm. um, there is something like that. Like, like the, the Genesee County yes. one. Yeah. Or um, the um, Swanson. What is his the, last name was Swanson, I believe. Yeah. What is the one? Um, Passion, compassion project. Oh, Prison the compassion. Project. So oh. Fritzy Horstman, yes. I love her. Fritzy, we love you. You gotta be on our show. Come <laughs> hang with us, yes. girl. Um, yeah, Fritzy Horstman, she does this prison compassion project that's just like amazing. And we'll we'll add it, you know, to um, the link to all of our stuff. But it really goes into like shame. She does the no shame prison circle. And it's just amazing because it really makes you realize like, you know, I think people who don't have any experience with prison and other things, you know, like my dad did 27 years in prison. So I love me an old prison dude, you know, like that's my heart. Um, but people who don't have anything to do with that world, it seems like a monster factory, right? Mm -hmm. It seems scary. That's where all the bad people go, you know, and some of these things, <laughs> right. and it's like, you know, you see it in a totally different light after you watch this compassion circle, because, you know, she's asking them questions. She's got everybody on the perimeter and she's basically saying like, <laughs> You know, it, often or very often, did you have a parent or, you know, caretaker who swore at you and degraded you? Mm -hmm. Take a step forward in the circle. Mm -hmm. And every Raising single it. one, you know, took a step. And, mm -hmm. you know, so it just progresses, you know, more and more. And it just like really makes you realize like uh, the percentage of people within those institutions who are traumatized people. And so when we start talking about, you know, just, you know, drugs, you know, we just did our other podcast, you know, about um, trauma. And so that's heavily in here. And I hate to say it, but there's a lot of people who are using drugs because they've got so much damn trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a coping skill. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Angel talks about the cake and like, this is the frosting on the outside and what you see and, you know, your identity and all these things. And then the ingredients, you know, beneath it, it's like, we need to get to the ingredients of what's going on behind these things. Because if you're concerned about the fact that somebody's putting cocaine up their nose, maybe you should be concerned about the trauma that they're suppressing by putting that cocaine up their or nose. Or the pain they're trying to escape from yep. or actually feel. Yep. Yeah. Because totally. sometimes um, you develop so many um, 
survival skills. And when trauma happens, you can't feel, you become numb. Mm -hmm. and, and there's times where if I'm activated for any long period of time, now I can't really feel anything. And and that's the yeah. stigma around some people who use cutting as a way to, to feel. feel. Yeah. Um, often people are like, oh, that's taboo attention seeking, or they're trying to kill themselves. No, actually, those are just your judgments that you've been taught to think about people. The reality is there's there's a need not being met and they're trying to meet that need. So when we think about when Nixon passed this back in 1971, um, the war on drugs, that's 1971. I'm 50. I was born in 1971 and we have not gotten better, but our prison systems have gotten filled and we've built mm -hmm. more and more and we've become a huge hot mess. Yes. Yeah. More people in jail per capita than anywhere else in the world. Wow. By a stretch. It's crazy. Really? By a stretch. Well, yeah, we pu yeah. penalize Maybe. and punitive practices mm -hmm. and coercive practices. So, so here you have like the, um, here you have these, the, the kind of core of the war on drugs and, um, and then the outer layer are the people who are trying to, you know, um, fix, fix the drug problem. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the exterior layers, the prison systems that are maximizing from, uh, the failures of fixing the system of this war on drugs. It's just like multiplying and getting worse and worse. That's kind of how I visualize mm -hmm. it. And then you think about us working in healthcare or behavioral healthcare or, or social services, we're kind of like trying to interweave through all of it to, to really just gain uh, a connection with mm -hmm. the people who are accessing these systems. And they're the one, we're the ones that are just like weaving through, but then you have some that are trained to be punitive, mm -hmm. to be coercive, like um, tough love measures, intervention measures that um, instead of building relationships and trust and connection with people. Yeah. Yeah, because absolutely. that the more we shame and blame people and and push them to do what we believe is right or what we need them to do to keep them out of these prison systems, um, the more isolated they become and col colonizing with each other rather than building community with, yeah. with everyone and staying connected to society. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I'm glad that you mentioned it like that because, you know, we were just talking about this Genesee County initiative that they're doing. Um, and, you know, that's how I look at it. I'm like, why are we literally throwing people in concrete blocks, you know, basically who all have trauma, who all have, you know, stuff going on within them and not using that as some kind of rehabilitation, like some kind of healing. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's the exact opposite. It's yeah. more traumatization. Um, so yeah, Genesee County in Michigan, um, which is like Saginaw, I believe they actually have this really cool program called Ignite that we've been, you know, trying to communicate with them about because we're real curious um, where they basically turn their prison into a college. Mm -hmm. And so once, you know, once you get into your area, then you get to look at the roster of all the things that you can take and mm -hmm. you decide what you want. So there's some self-directed, yep. you know, stuff true, embedded. True rehabilitation. Yeah. 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 That is awesome. This An is opportunity. Really awesome. Just very quickly yeah. from the Bureau of Prisons website. Um, February 22nd, sorry, February 12th, 2022, <clears throat> the number of percentage of inmates that are on drug offenses, 45.3%. That what? is ridiculous. That is outrageous. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to have a lot of people who are in the so-called recovery community, whatever that means. Biggest for, that's a ridiculous number. It's the that biggest are, number. That are going to say that it took going to jail or prison to help them get Shh. it. So there are some sure, people. Sure. So we don't want to discount that. Yes, We're yes. not but, saying that. But, but is a it lot possible? Of... Is it possible that if you approach mm -hmm. people, um, I mean, perhaps this is the time that we could mention what's happening in other places in the world, but yeah. in Portugal, for instance, where they have taken that step mm -hmm. to decriminalize, and they, when there is an issue with uh, somebody with a substance use issue, and they approach them with a social worker mm -hmm. and an attorney. And uh, somebody and a therapist and mm -hmm. people who can help with support around mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. around those needs. I mean, because I, I think it is about trying to meet those needs and keep people yeah. connected. It was yeah. about connection and mm -hmm. keeping them connected, mm -hmm. not shaming and blaming them. Mm -hmm. That's the core values that I mm -hmm. think we lack in mm -hmm. our society yeah. is, um, you know, like I remember two, a decade and a half, two decades ago, I was in Arizona and I 
love Arizona. Uh, but Sheriff Joe was in office and he would make uh, all their prisons and uh, you had to wear, these men had to wear pink. And um, and they have, back then, they had the old chain gains. In fact, it's talked Doesn't about- Doesn't Joe the, know real men wear pink? Um, <laughs> well, but, but then they were shamed. It was de- and, they and were and trying was, to degrade. It was de- degrading. Yeah, yeah the mindset totally. was degradation, yeah. right? Totally. And they were degrading people. So I just wanted to also honor, you know, people who say that um, it took going to jail or prison to get them on this path. Well, what if um, they had a different mandated and choice driven, personal choice driven yeah. option before, it gets before to you point. got to prison? Maybe that might have also been something that could Bing, have supported. Light bulb <laughs> and maybe now you wouldn't be walking around. Some people, I, I do know a few that I love very dearly, but they're still very rigid, like work the steps or die, I'm an effer, you know? And then they're like, you, you haven't hit bottom yet. This and that. If you did this and you did that, it took me to go into prison. And I'm like, yeah. Honey, I love you. Yes, and, right? And, not but, and there's missing pieces of your knowledge right now because you haven't, you're, you've been trained to think this one way that it fits everybody's needs. Yeah. And, and what if you avoided traumatization of going into prison? Because I can imagine you, you and your family were traumatized yeah. because mm-hmm. you were taken out of the community, placed in this place and penalized, punitive practices. And then shipped a hundred miles shamed. to a place. Oh my mm-hmm. gosh. Yeah. So Well, and what if while visit. that family was dealing with chaos, and and traumatization within the family unit and the community and all of those things, if things were brought into that community that helped with all of that, you know, that's like my argument is like, I'm one of those people, you know, I did eight and a half months in jail, um, you know, waking up, throwing up, you know, pregnant on the concrete floor, you know, in some podunk nowhere jail, (laughs) you know, like went Yes, it did help me to decide that I did not want to continue to do that. When I left there, I was like, I'll never go to jail again, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But on the same token, there were so many moments where something could have helped with me, you know, in that process beforehand. And I really, truly believe a ton of it was like community outreach, like Things being brought into the community, like community centers and family Mm -hmm. programs, you know, to where we live, because where we lived, we were all the same. We all had chaos. All of our parents were using, you know, so to us, that was our normalcy. Um, And so there are definitely prevention before intervention ways Mm -hmm. to do that so that the people don't even have to get to that, you know, point of prison, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. to be able to deal with, you know, whatever kind of use is going on and other things well before. Yeah, yes, I really appreciate that perspective of mm-hmm. uh, prevention. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's something we don't, I don't think we focus on that enough. Mm-hmm. And um, I think developing an awareness for the issues that are affecting various communities and not just making assumptions, um, but really kind of um, decentralizing these processes, which is the opposite direction that we're going in Mm -hmm. you know something I've thought about a lot with um with uh especially with just with the uh the pandemic is this idea of population management you know we think about that in healthcare is managing populations and I feel like if there's one thing that I've learned just as a physician and somebody who thinks about public health that you cannot you, you, it has to be a decentralized. No, you, there's no such thing. <laughs> there's no such thing. I mean, you think across the world, you know, um, it just has to be a decentralized process where you're really focused on getting um, getting information out to people and finding out what their needs are and what their values are and mm-hmm. trying to match those things. Um, and there's and a it, ton of community organizations out there yes. doing very yes. much that yes. stuff. Pockets. Yes. So why are yes. we not they're not being utilized increasing the funding for these types of mm-hmm. organizations mm-hmm. to maximize what their possibilities are that they could offer and yeah. you know replicate these beautiful programs that then people that becomes the standard that becomes the norm rather than the prison system rather yeah. than the yeah. um mm-hmm. you know driving this I mean think about how it would help you know our law enforcement heal in their own ways because then they'll go back to the roots of peace officers why don't we have some sort of matrix Mm -hmm. that supports these types of things Mm -hmm. rather than 
continually to keep everybody on guard. You just said 49% or 41, 45%, 45%. 45%. 45%. Of what the, the hell? Of website. That's amazing. That's Which annoying. I can't even resources. imagine how but much money that is. But these are people's fathers and mothers yeah. and brothers and sisters. Well, and, and think about that trauma, mm, right? So, yes. you know, you get caught with it some dope down. on you and you go to prison and then now your children are being raised in a stressful home because a mom's trying to take care of her kids all or on dad. her own or a dad, mm -hmm. you or know, um, you know, taking this person out of the home. Um, you know, just creates more re-traumatization, mm -hmm. you know, completely within that system. And yeah. then now they've missed out. So now they're behind. I think we cracked a joke about it in one of our podcasts about like when my dad first got out trying to make phone calls and I was staring straight up his nose the whole time, you know, and we <laughs> laughed. We thought it was funny and adorable, you know, but the truth is he was frustrated, you know, yeah. 27 years. So to get out and try to reacclimate to anything seemed really odd and really yeah, strange. Yeah. And so when they come back, you know, what, are they just going to hop back into the thing, you know, yeah. and everything's going to be hunky-dory? Mm -hmm. No, because now they have a family who's been mm -hmm. seriously traumatized, mm -hmm. going to see him in prison, changing the baby's diaper in front of a CO, you know, like that in itself is traumatizing, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, that, you know, they're breaking up families, mm -hmm. they're destroying systems, you know, rather than working on the fact that that is a coping skill that that person is using, um, you know, to deal with some trauma or to deal yeah. with some other things. So it's like, let's, let's tackle the trauma mm -hmm. and not imprison the parents and, you know, well, when I was I'm on, biased, when though, I was but, on meth, yeah. when I was on meth, a lot of the times, um, well, A, I have ADD, so it helped me focus. That was like, mm -hmm. as soon as I tried meth, I wanted nothing to do with any other drug. I was like, yes, this is for me. Um, but then out on the streets, out, you know, in communities that were unsafe, that was a way for me to be hyper alert, stay awake, not, um, there were times where I didn't sleep for days. Why? Not because I was just excited about this drug, but because I wasn't safe in the house that yeah. I was at. You couldn't sleep. Yeah. Or the park mm -hmm. bench that I stayed yeah. at yeah. or the totally. penthouse where there's all kinds of really, really, really big things happening. And I'm like, I need to keep myself safe. Yeah. Right. And so, so when we think about if, when people think about judging someone, think about what, what's happening? Why? Yeah. Right. Ask yourself why. And instead of, I could have easily with the amount of drugs that I was around the entire time that I was out there, 16 to 24, I'm telling you, I could have easily been in prison the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I just happened to be one that didn't get caught up in the criminal justice system. I yeah. just got really lucky. I did get in trouble, but I didn't get caught up because I was protected by those who were around me who were the ones that were getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. They're like, no, 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 she don't know anything. Thankfully, Thank thankfully. But the it's not the drugs, it's the criminal criminalization mm -hmm. of the Criminal drugs right. that right. creates our societal challenges, mm -hmm. right? Agreed. So why don't we say instead of a war on drugs, why don't we say a war on a societal criminalization of people who are harmed or hurting right. or using it as Trauma a survival survivors. skill, Trauma mm -hmm. survivors. Mm -hmm. You know, think about it differently. It's just really frustrating to my brothers, one of my brothers, I had one that worked in the prison system for 25, almost 30 years as a CO at Folsom Prison. And then I had another brother that spent multiple years, um, over, over a decade of his life at one time, um, in prison for drugs. Mm -hmm. And, and actually we had, it was really a big deal because he was originally going to be sentenced to a more maximum, maximized, uh, prison in, in, um, from what I understand in California and because my other brother was a CO and had been working in a maximum security prison for so long, we had to keep that a secret. Mm -hmm. And we had, uh, the, even the court systems put him in a medium, I think medium or light wow. because of the risks to his life yeah. because, because of, of his brother. Mm -hmm. So gotcha. when you think about like that, even, you mm -hmm. know, like here, you're putting somebody in there that we had been using drugs since we were little kids, not by the fault of my mother. My mother was gone working all the time or mm -hmm. she struggled with her own depression. So we were latchkey kids. Mm -hmm. How do you just shame somebody who's been using some these things and and been groomed by a community mm -hmm. of others in that culture of drugs? Mm -hmm. It becomes your norm. Mm -hmm. How do you know anything else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. How do you know anything else? That's your normal. Yeah. It's frustrating because people are judged all the time. People ask me, <coughs> I share my story and people are like, what? You were on drugs? Yeah, I've been off drugs for twenty, almost 26 years. July will be 26 years, but that doesn't mean wow. that <coughs> you're looking at me because I, now I'm this educated professional, community leader, whatever the titles that come along with doing advocacy work and activism work and social change work. Well, you see me now, that's the icing on the cake. What are my ingredients? When I start to share my personal experience, you should see some of the the faces mm -hmm. like, what? You know, shock and awe. Like, you don't look like what, well, what does a drug, a, a person in recovery or a person mm -hmm. in, in their addiction really look like? Mm -hmm. You know, but you have this image. But the media says. The media like. says, mm -hmm. yeah. Or, or maybe you do have a family member that's sure. really or a friend or somebody close to you or that you've observed that really struggled and then um, maybe ha even harmed you. And so now that shapes the way you see all people in that, in that culture. And, and then there's cultures under different cultures. So you've got the, you know, psychedelic culture, right? And that's kind of just more of like, um, even what is that stuff? They take uh, Molly, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got this kind of peace, love and, and excitement yeah, and, and, and pathogens. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so thank you. And so the the stigma around that culture isn't like the meth culture. And right. then you look at the meth culture or the stimulant culture, right? And then you have subcultures under that. Sorry. And it's interesting to um, kind of break it down. Like I'm, mm -hmm. I like to kind of break it all down from culture. We That's why we train on culture, curiosity, inclusivity, and accountability, mm -hmm. um, because it's not just about the color of our skin or where we grew up and those sorts of things. It's about all of it. It's about how to break down the different cultures and subcultures. You know, if you're a native American, uh, indigenous community, you've got multiple different types of cultures of different drugs within that mm -hmm. and very different philosophy, even, you know, uh, BIPOC community, same thing. I mean, we're, we're all, we're all intermixed with different cultures. So we mm -hmm. need to be thinking about not just the, what I'm seeing, but ask yourself, what am I seeing and why, how have I learned to think that way? Mm -hmm. And then ask, I wonder what this is about rather than they're bad, they're evil, they're incapable, they're mm -hmm. criminals. Well, and I think about too, about like, you know, people were doing real time, you know, for, for drug charges. Um, why do you think that that is? Why do you think they decided to sell drugs? Right. Mm -hmm. Because they want money because they have families to take care of and other. Right. And so my brain always goes to like, okay, well, what if instead of imprisoning these people, what if a program like Genesee County, you know, like college prison, I don't know what, intermixed exactly how with that the works. Prison, Compassion Prison Project mm -hmm. mindset. Intermixed mm -hmm. with that. Healing right? and opportunities. Healing, Healing and, and opportunities. opportunities. Ooh, that's teach another. them a skill. Teach them how to make good ass money because mm -hmm. that's what I hear a lot. People are like, Fawn, I was just making so much fucking money. Yeah. How could I not? Yeah. Well, guess what? You can make good money other ways. But nobody's teaching them. You have transferable skills. skills. Yes. If you've been sales, you could be selling Jaguars, yeah. the, right? The minimum, we got to talk about the minimum wage. Another podcast. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, we need a living wage in this country. Yeah. We need a living wage. There has Absolutely. to be opportunities yeah, to make Well, and jobs. the criminality, right? Like when you're raised in criminality, that's all you know. And that's that's how you think. So like, you know, she said transferable skills. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. You know, that that makes a ton of sense. You yeah. know, if you're if you're out there doing your business, you're one sweet talker. Yeah. You could be selling Lamborghinis, yes, you which you're gonna could. make hella money, yeah. you know, doing mm -hmm. so. And yep. so when you really think or about stock it markets. creatively, mm -hmm. or yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's Getting so some many training. opportunities, yeah. but in underprivileged communities, families nobody is teaching you those things nobody's mm -hmm. like hey you know what you should be a real estate agent someday yep. never heard my whole life mm -hmm. yeah, right right but I if i was in real estate i might be making some loot right now yeah. at least in oregon what about the white you know? collar individuals who are using drugs you know it's a very different culture right mm -hmm. or um individuals that do have those platforms of opportunity yeah. prior to becoming. My dad was a very successful businessman and he was a musician and he, um, um, although I didn't live with him and rarely ever saw him, he used a lot of drugs and mm -hmm. he had a lot of money and mm -hmm. he built custom pool tables and woodwork and he was very wealthy. Well, um, eventually that catches up to a person, yeah. right? And even though he didn't 
enter into the criminal justice system because they had the skills, the knowledge, and the networks right. to and the attorneys and the attorneys it. to avoid <laughs> yes. that, right? Yes. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. there's there's so much to think about. Yeah. But how do we try to really put an emphasis on decriminalizing and and some yeah. things even legalizing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? So le- if I think about the safe places where people have safe injection sites, you know, mm-hmm. it's almost like um, – what do we, yeah, I don't remember the name of uh, what we use, so I'll skip that. But um, if we provide a connecting place, a place where people become connected, have a safe space to inject or whatever that they're going to do, avoid overdose and network and build trusting relationships over time Mm -hmm. and feel like this is my brave space. I'm going to go inject. um, I'm not going to get in trouble. I'm not going to go to prison. And then you've got the other side of the spectrum where people are like, that's enabling. Is it or is it keeping people connected long enough to become well? Yeah. Yeah. It's It's that harm reduction, right? Harm reduction. That centerpiece to the work that we're doing. Mm-hmm. Well, and, you know, Oregon legalized, you know, marijuana, pot, cannabis um, mm-hmm. <laughs> about six years ago. And look what it's done. You know what I'm saying? Millions of dollars right now. That measure 110 money. That's where it came from. Well, people you know, are going to dollars. jail or jail for pot. Yeah, either, right? Too, like, so which is just amazing. Of- prison. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I know a lot of people who use, you know, cannabis medicinally. um, And I also know a lot of people who use it recreationally not to flip out on somebody or to be able to get some sleep and all of these other things, you know? And so it's like, I'm so glad that Oregon was open in that way. And I know a lot of other states are now too, Colorado, Michigan. I mean, I could probably list, you know, half a dozen of them. Um, But just to see the difference of what it's done as far as bringing dollars into our state and, you know, making a way for people to access their own medicine without having to worry about catching a case. Mm -hmm. You know how many people I've, I know um, that have gotten off of this uh, psychiatric yep. medications that utilize totally um, and off other you know and, working and, at the clinic mm-hmm. yeah there were a lot of people who were coming off heroin and using bupe but they just were like we just need a little pot just to like curb the things mm-hmm. you know to feel like I'm mm-hmm. doing you know just a little bit of something and their life quality of life changes it and does. thrives right like, yeah absolutely and with the studies of psychiatric drugs you know people dying 25 years earlier than yeah. the average person um, who've been diagnosed with psychiatric conditions and. Uh, placed on medications. When you look at that data, and that's been like part of what's driving our our country to change our health system in that way. Um, mm-hmm. Getting off of psychiatric medications, Will Hall created a book probably, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago um, that is called Getting Off of Psychiatric Medications. Yep. Um, and it, um, it, I know a lot of people who are using um, other things that support their wellness path um, that uh, psychiatric medications made them just numb or um, completely out of the box of who they truly are as a character. Mm-hmm. You know, and their organs are dying. Book, yeah. You what know. I love about that book is that he literally says, I'm not saying – come off your meds, you know, I'm not saying trash your meds. I'm saying that if that's not working for you, let's talk about how to do this. Let's talk about how to do it safely. Yes. Um, You know, how to moderate. And if things aren't working, you know, go back up a little bit, you know, Mm -hmm. like, yeah, it is important. I have a really dear friend in Michigan who has TARDIS dyskinesia because of the amount of, you know, psychiatric medications that he was pumped full of, you know, his whole life. Um, And he struggles, you know, greatly because of it. Um, Just the, you know, the data revolving around dying 25 years early, Mm -hmm. you know, people with mental health conditions dying early. It's, it's, it's sad. Yeah, it is. I would say very complicated cases in some, in some um, respects and probably like, I think Angel, you just mentioned related to sometimes organ damage Mm -hmm. from Mm -hmm. the, um, from the medications, Mm -hmm. but um, yeah. It does definitely take a toll, Mm -hmm. definitely take a toll and not everybody. Mm -hmm. It's just a very, very delicate process treating Mm -hmm. mental health conditions and trying to find the right medications. Mm -hmm. And um, and they certainly don't work for everybody. Mm -hmm. They don't work for everybody. And start with the CBC, right? Mm -hmm. Like check people's vitamin D, check their Mm -hmm. iron, check their thyroids, check their, you know, all of the tests that that could come first that we don't do. That's just, that's a whole nother topic. I think we already touched on, but 
um, and on a different podcast. Yeah. But and a lot of times, I think the answer is not going to be in the blood work because that's a quick and easy right. thing to right. do. It's, it's going to be easy. in that hour long conversation that yes. you just don't have time. That you, you just don't have time. Don't have time and it might take. also yeah. be your, you know, all the other eight dimensions of wellness. Right. You know, mm-hmm. hello. Mm-hmm. Let's look at mind, body, spirit. You know, all, of, all everything. Let's look at everything. Let's yeah. Stop. Yeah. Well, and from like the hooey side of things, right? Mm-hmm. From the, the hippity dippity spiritual side of things, you know, I, I always t- think about the body and about resonance and what mm-hmm. frequency, you know, we're resonating at and raising my frequency and being a better person and mm-hmm. some of these things. And if you think about it, you know, the highest resonance is gratitude. Mm-hmm. So it's like, how do you take somebody who's been so beat down and been through mm-hmm. so many things and make them feel gratitude, mm-hmm. right? That's hard. Yeah. And then you start judging them. Oh, they're just... um they're just uh, here to get something. They're just here to get, you know, the shoes or yeah. the jacket or the food or the bed. Well, we teach people to come to us for bed, a pill, and a rest. Right. We don't teach people to, or connect people, I should say. We don't connect people back to society or socially connect them to get a job, a home, and a friend. Yeah. Right? Oh. Well, and it's yeah. like if, if resonance is the highest frequency – or, or, you know, gratitude is the highest frequency. And if that's what we could feel all the time, if we're always just so mm-hmm. grateful, you know, all my hippity dippy friends who love yoga mm-hmm. and Reiki and all these things, it's like, oh, gratitude, you know, practice gratitude every day, gratitude. How in the hell can you feel gratitude if you're not, you know, dealing with all the underlying things? That's why people self-medicate. You know, because they're unhappy. Mm -hmm. Something's missing, Mm -hmm. you know, whether it was something in their childhood or something now or, you know, dealing with something that they haven't even, don't even know, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's it's Mm self-medication. Profound suffering. Mm -hmm. Profound Profound suffering. suffering. Profound. Profound suffering. I see it over and over again. You think, wow. Yes. And you just wonder, how do you keep going yeah. in that state of profound suffering? But it's so common. Mm-hmm. That's it's the so resilience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We just mm-hmm. get tougher and tougher. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. And keep. And also in this culture, there's no, there's no rest. Right. You know, there's no downtime. Mm-hmm. There's no, um, there's no time for, to restore yourself. Right. Um, because everybody's working two jobs, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, working yeah. two jobs and outside of the house, and then who's got time for restoration? Then, yeah, you know, yeah. really makes it challenging to really just, um, yeah, to heal, to heal, yeah, mm-hmm. to heal and rest and sleep. That is so important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, getting a good, getting a good night's sleep, and so uncommon. Yeah. And healthy meals, you know, I mean, think about food is medicine. I, yeah, mm-hmm. food is medicine. So thinking about um, all of the different places, like, I mean, it's really hard to find healthy meals, mm-hmm. <laughs> if mm-hmm. especially if you're living For houseless or in mm-hmm. certain communities um, or have, you know, limited income. You know, me, I'm nomadic right now, you know, living from place to place. And um, when I'm, you know, at one place, I might feel really good or uh, comfortable to be able to, to, to go to the grocery store and get some things and make myself a healthy meal. But mm-hmm. then there's other times where I'm might be working around the community from 8am to, you know, like, yesterday and I didn't get home until 10 o'clock last night and I was gone at 8 a.m. you know mm-hmm. and and today I mean what time is it now so yeah so thinking about that oh okay I might go get you know I'm on also a limited income at this time as well be living this way so I'm gonna go get me a two dollar bean bean and cheese burrito mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. um a it's quick b it's it's cheap and mm-hmm. but it's extremely Unhealthy, (laughs) you know, and I, I feel it after I eat it. I'm like, oh my God, I could take a nap right now. And, (laughs) you know, versus, um, finding a place that has fresh produce that's, you know, I do like the carts in, in Oregon or Portland Mm -hmm. area. We can find different meals that are at carts, That is nice. you know, especially the taco checks, but, um, you know, anyway, so I think that we're missing a lot. And so how does that go back to. Legalizing versus criminalizing, decriminalizing. Decrim- yes. Well, let's see. Tying things together. Um, so we were off in that world of harm reduction, I mm-hmm. think, for a little bit, which, as we said, is central to the work that we're doing. But um, I think 
It is about meeting people where they are, yeah. meeting people in the space that they are living in at that very moment and trying to meet those needs, whatever those needs might be, um, and trying to help them find healing, mm -hmm. trying to help them find, but rather than punishing them mm -hmm. for those survival skills. Um, then something else that comes to mind for me is that whole world of uh, psychedelics mm -hmm. that has that has been kind of taboo for so long. Yeah. Um, that is now hopefully finally Starting coming to. onto the yes coming coming back into the world of uh, mainstream um, clinical medicine. Yeah, psilocybin I specifically. Think. We were mm -hmm. just talking about ibogaine. Yeah. You know, yeah. yesterday, which I mean. It's amazing. The people that I know who've had ibogaine treatment, they go down to Mexico and they come out with no heroin addiction. And it's just like yeah. the most amazing yeah. thing ever. Mm -hmm. But guess what? It's illegal here. Mm -hmm. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. So obviously not accessible, super expensive, you know, all of the things. Um, but if there were studies done on it, which there's not because Pfizer's not paying for stuff like that, um, you know, you would see that the, you know, people are there's lives are changing and improving because of ibogaine. Yeah. You know, but uh, we're not allowed to have that here. Yeah. So really mm -hmm. having to being open to exploring other other options yeah. and other ways what of What about healing. other other countries and um yeah. other cultures that actually that's part of their daily ritual, right? Yeah. right? Ceremony. And long history. Yeah, these. their long history of that. You know, I know uh, I know shamans, yep, I know spiritual practice. healers that practice using um various different um psychedelics through ritual and mm -hmm. and they're amazingly just beautiful people loving and and they're just really offering a lot to the world and they're well they're yeah. well you know people think oh psychedelics you're gonna create a bunch of people who are addicted right and um we're not looking at it as uh, healing properties. Of, yeah, right. As medicine. That, yeah, as, as medicine, medicine as other cultures do. Yeah. yeah or see absolutely. it as just part yeah. of their norm. Well, we need education mm -hmm. and we need to eliminate, destigmatize. De we need it. to bring awareness. De Jeez. That's right. <laughs> awareness. We do. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. It all starts with awareness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then action. It, it, yeah. Advocacy, wellness, education. Yeah. <laughs> now you got me all education, Advocacy, twisted. wellness, action, recovery, and education. education. Yeah. 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 I have yeah. something that is a be kind that I'd like to read for the exit. Yeah. I would, I would like that. to hear it. Would you like to hear it? Yes, okay. Thank let's you. put a be kind message out to people. Hold on. Here I go reading again. Ugh. You know how traumatizing that is for somebody with dyslexia? Do you want me to read it, Angel? No, I'm okay. going to sit in my discomfort long enough to grow through it. Good. Yes. Great job. So I, I got to that point where I'm getting to that point where I just don't care what people think about how I read. So mm -hmm. let's just go here. I think that's smart. Yeah. Impact. Not kindness. Impact. But it incorporates kindness. So impact, you never really know the true impact you have on those around you. You never know how much someone needed that smile you gave them. You never know how much the, your kindness turned someone's entire life around. You never know how much someone needed that long hug or deep talk. So don't wait to be kind. Don't wait for someone else to be kind first. Don't wait for better circumstances or for someone to change. Just be kind because you never know how much someone needs it. And so I just want to add the don't language. Um, your subconscious mind doesn't hold on to the don't. So anything that follows the don't or like don't forget. Be um, like do, remember. <laughs> remember too, right? And so we want to be mindful about the language and how we say something. So I might uh, reframe that to um, a piece like um, don't wait to start first mm -hmm. or be the first for someone else to be kind. Be the first mm -hmm. to be kind, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Or be the first to be kind. And then it says don't wait for better circumstances or for someone to change. 
say, uh, we might say, how would we say that in a moving and something that we wanted to acquire? Do practice patience. Practice mm-hmm. patience and um, uh, thank individuals for being who they are, mm-hmm. right? Um, just be kind because promote you never- Promote unique. Pr- mm-hmm. Promote uniqueness, yeah. right? Normalize uniqueness. Yeah. Um, so anyway, impact. Be kind. Uh, when you're thinking about um, or when you've listened to this podcast, I think it's really important for you to just ask yourself, how have I learned to think about these topics? And ask yourself, is it a solid, hardcore truth and value um, that I that I need to continue, or can I get curious mm-hmm. about other things mm-hmm. and do your homework and do your well and I mean and, and sometimes go down the rabbit hole. Go down sometimes. the rabbit hole. Don't find the first few links yeah, on the, on the totally. search engine because Set your sources. Yeah, yeah, and and type in something that you wouldn't normally type in, so it right. throws off the algorithm. Yeah, for right? real. Right? <laughs> No, but it's important Otherwise because that's how we, we know maybe. what we know yeah. is because, you know, we care enough to do the research, mm-hmm. you know, so it's important. It is. Data mm-hmm. gathering. Mm-hmm. So, well, who's going to um, take us out? Is that me? It's you, Christine. Yeah. Your turn. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Mm-hmm. Um, we are aware we're hoping that you were able to spend this time with us and uh, grow and learn and um, ask questions. Um, if you'd like to know more about the work that we're doing, please find us on Facebook or LinkedIn or Instagram. <laughs> Insta. YouTube. Or YouTube. YouTube <laughs> or awareconsulting.org. Our website. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Sending love and light your way, guys. Yes. Have a great day or evening. Bye.